Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, host of the Better Off Podcast. On today's program, we are going to help you put your financial life in order with New York Times reporter and author John Schwartz. I just don't like thinking about money. I'm scared of it. I have never understood why, but I can explain that I am. These things are braided in our minds. It wasn't like going through some terrible emotional crucible growing up, Mm -hmm. but we also just didn't talk about money. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Uh, You know, when we talk about this program, Better Off, we want to make your lives better off. Makes sense. What do you do when you have a stumble in your life? Many of you call and you, you, you ask us advice about how to get back on track. Well, today we've got a wonderful interview with John Schwartz. He's a writer at The New York Times. He's recently penned a book called This is the Year I Put My Financial Life in Order. Now, give the guy high marks for just putting his stuff out there. There is no shame on this program, and there is no shame in introducing to you the concept that when your financial life goes off the rails, there may be a way to get it back in line. So John Schwartz is going to help you. He's got various tips. Most of these tips are really run-of-the-mill tips, but I think it will surprise you that this really smart, intelligent guy made some classic mistakes and also got a little unlucky. So here's our interview with John Schwartz. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. John Schwartz, welcome to Better Off. Thank you. Uh, We start the program with a very important question, which is really essentially your entire book. But you ready? What's your best financial decision you've ever made? Starting a 401k when I got my first real job. And you did that because you knew you should or because the employer said, you got to do this, or your boss says, hey, kid, put some money in there? My employer made it available. I'd been waiting like a year to be able to do it. And friend said, you are crazy not to do this. All these things came together. And at that very moment, I also got a big raise. And so all of a sudden I had a raise so that the money could go away and I wouldn't notice. That's Those three things together, maybe four now, uh, made it possible to start it with 10% of my income. I didn't have to work up incrementally, do the ratchet, any of that. And then I kind of forgot about it. And, and that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, my God. All right. So you've written a book. It's called This is the Year I Put My Financial Life in Order. I loved this book. And I loved it because it is raw. It is emotional. It is honest. And I think it must have been incredibly difficult to write. So talk to me about why you felt like you had to put this down on paper. You wrote it, an initial article about how you were essentially a financial F up. Exactly right. And I did that. It came out in 2015. And it laid out how poorly I had managed my finances, how how little attention I'd paid to it, and how the nervousness about it was creeping up and creeping up and creeping up. And it was time for me to at least take a look and see where I stood for retirement. In looking at doing a full book, I realized I had to think about and then write about my entire financial history. And what a screw up I'd been in a lot of ways. And uh, and then educate myself to be able to deal with this stuff. And it's not just, am I ready for retirement? But it's also, you're 58 years old and you don't have a will yet. What's wrong with you? I know. It's so, and we hear these questions because we take calls to the show and we get these questions all the time. And I, I guess that when you looked at all of that, it takes a real ability to get honest with yourself. It's like you're going to therapy and you can't lie to the shrink. And so, but you're sharing your therapeutic sessions with us. It's true, but how else do I explain to people what they need to do except by showing what I should have done? How else do I show you that this is worth doing without showing what I did wrong. And, you know, I did a lot of things wrong. I mean, we lost an apartment. Let's go back and tell your story of origin. First of all, where are you from? I'm from Galveston, Texas. 
You're a Jew from Texas? I'm a Jew from Texas. There are many of us. Kinky Friedman. Kinky Friedman. I've met him. Okay. So you grew up in Texas. You went to a decent high school? Decent public high school. Ball High School, Galveston. Go Tornadoes. Okay. And then you go off to college? University of Texas at Austin. And then what happened? What did you do in college? Like, were you, were you like partying? Were you a studier? I was um, a pretty good student, and, you know, graduated with honors and all that stuff, but but I just fell into the, the social life there. I loved it. I got to be editor of the school newspaper. Oh. Um, I went to law school there, basically for lack of a plan. You know, I finished, I finished my undergraduate. I found the academic stuff just fun. When I graduated at the end of four years, I went back for another year to take classes that I hadn't been able to take because I was afraid of them. So that extra year, you know, that that year of going back in Mm -hmm. was just really important for me. And then I went on to law school. So wait a second. Did you tell me about the cost of college for an in-state kid who gets into UT Austin? This is why I could do all this. University of Texas at Austin in the 1970s, back when we rode our dinosaurs to class, cost less than $200 a semester. Less than $200 a semester. When I got into law school, my books cost more than my tuition. Oh, my God. So you go to law school and you graduate. And what do you do? And you don't have well, any debt. Well, you don't have any debt when you right. graduate, I have, right? I have no debt. And my second year of law school, I've become editor of the Daily Texan, the student newspaper at the University of Texas. And my mornings and early afternoons are spent at the law school hanging out with people who are going to be lawyers. And then in the afternoon and evening, into way late at night, I'm hanging out at the Daily Texan, and I'm trying to write my editorials, and we're dealing with all the craziness of student journalism. And I have this bifurcated life. It becomes pretty clear to me that not only am I having more fun at night than I am in the morning, but that I'm more like the people I'm with at night than I am with the people in the morning. There's nothing wrong with lawyers. Two of my brothers and my father, you know, they're all lawyers. I love lawyers. But it sort of dawned on me that I might not be a very good lawyer, and I could be a pretty good journalist. And uh, and so I've got this thing weighing in the balance. And I go to Jean, who is my girlfriend from the week before, well, I met her the week before her classes started in freshman year, and now we've been together like six years, seven years, and we're planning to get married. And I said, look, I'd really like to try being a reporter. I'd like to try being a journalist for a while. I don't know if it's going to work, but would you mind if we did this? You know, let's give it a couple of years. At the end of five years, if I've got a real job and a dental plan, then I'd like to stick with it. And if not, then I'll still have the bar card and, you know, I can do divorces or whatever it is I'm capable of doing as a lawyer. And she said, are we going to move? Because she was ready to leave Austin by then. We'd been there a lot of years. Mm -hmm. And she was interested in going to New York, and I was interested in going to New York. And so we came to an agreement. And we could do it because there was no debt. Right. We could do it because you could just take a shot. So you go to New York, and what's your first job? I got a job at Newsweek. All right. Let's talk about, like, how the financial situation starts to evolve. What is what is the original sin in your mind of what happened in your financial life? So you, you obviously used a 401k, so you did that. What happened that, co- that kind of derailed a lot of your efforts in those earlier years? Besides living in New York, which I don't know if you know this, it's an expensive place. I've heard. Yeah, it I've can heard. Be. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, because lots of people live in New York and do well, uh, we decided that we needed to get an apartment. We needed to buy. And all I knew was you can't go wrong in real estate. And so I looked around and we looked at a lot of places and we bought an enormous apartment in Washington Heights. Which was, by the way, very edgy for you to do at that time. What year is that? I think we're talking about 1987 or 88. Okay. And we fell in love with it. And, uh, and we had good neighbors and some bad neighbors. But it was, it was a great place, and it seemed like a bargain. We paid $136,000 for a three-bedroom apartment in Manhattan. Got a mortgage. Got a mortgage and started paying it. And it was 
something that we could afford within our budget. We looked at what we could afford and mm-hmm. what the mortgage would cost. And it would have been fine, except that I then got a job at the Washington Post in 1993. Okay. So five years later. Five years later, I'm still in this apartment. And you guys and are making your bills okay. You're pay- putting money into your 401k. You're paying the mortgage. We even have savings. You have some savings. Your wife's working or not working? Jean is working. Uh-huh. Uh, so you got a good combined income and cash flow's good. Mm-hmm. All so right. we're doing fine. Okay. But I got a job in Washington and it was a chance of a lifetime to go work at the Washington Post. And I, and I desperately wanted to do it. And so we moved and along with the fact that you can't go wrong in real estate Mm. you can always rent yes you can you You can always you can get a manager it's going to work great yeah you just get tenants collect the money so we got somebody helping us manage it and and uh and is the rent paying the mortgage nowhere near not even what percentage of the mortgage did you cover did what did the rent cover i think it was a little better than half Okay, but if at that time, were you considering selling and you said, oh, my God, we can't get our money out, and that's why you decided to rent? Or was it, oh, we're just going to collect rent, and rent's so great, and that's good. We don't want to give no, up our No, we New York. wanted to sell it. We, were, we, we figured it was time to sell. Mm-hmm. Um, the three-bedroom apartment was feeling small yeah. to us. And the neighborhood was you know, loud, and we, we, were, we were sort of moving away from apartment living. And at the same time... The building was going through, it was going to be a co-op conversion. We were buying co-ops. Yeah. But the number of apartments that had been converted to co-ops was low. Mm -hmm. And it was so low that banks would not issue a mortgage. Oh, so you couldn't sell it. You really were stuck. We were locked. Oh, brother. And I told real estate agents, we'll take a bath. Just you know, and get they said, me out. Yeah, and they said you will not find a bank that will loan your buyer the money. They said, well, can we have somebody assume the mortgage? They said that's not going to happen. And uh, and so bit by bit, and very quickly, the the post, the people at the post had said, we know it's hard to sell an apartment. We don't expect it to happen quickly. So we're going to give you X number of months of supplement. So we were getting something like nine hundred bucks a month. Uh huh. And that was. And so between the rent we were getting and the supplement, we were okay. Okay. Except we can't sell and then the supplement runs out. Ugh. The savings are being drained about the time that the tenant stops paying. And so we're now out of savings and desperate and the guy won't leave. The guy, I get him on the phone. He says, you know, you can't get me out of here. I know my rights. And it's a very ugly time mm. because... If I need a lawyer to help get him out, the lawyer costs money. Yeah, you I don't need have. like a freaking Rocco to go knock on the door and make it pay a visit. I I used to know people like that in Rhode Island who would do that just for fun. So how long did you have to suffer with this apartment? It was the better part of a year. Mm-hmm. I finally found a lawyer who you know good lawyers are therapists, and uh, and the lawyer said this is going to hurt, but what you need to do is offer this guy to forgive the debt if he will leave. Mm-hmm. He's now into you for thousands and thousands of dollars. But if you offer not to fight, he will go. And he did. And then what happened to the apartment? Well, then we found another tenant Yeah, who looked good. Again, I'm doing the things that I think I'm supposed to do. I'm doing credit checks. Right. And these people look good. The last guy looked good. Right. And, uh, and, um, and it was a very nice couple. And they were in for about three or four months, and then she calls me and she says, my husband has left and I can't pay. Ay, ay, ay. And it happens again. So so we're stuck. And my father-in-law, who's been, who is a law professor who knows real estate, says, you got to file for bankruptcy. You are, you are being dragged down by this apartment. Right. And you can get clear of this. And, uh, and there's no shame in it. Okay, and at that point, what were the assets? You had no bank account, but you had your 401k protected from bankruptcy. Exactly right. Um, did you own a home in D.C.? We were in the process of buying a home in D.C., and uh, and about the time we were considering all this, we were able to find, again, a wonderfully cheap place in, in uh, outside of D.C. in the little town of Tacoma Park. We found a place, 
you know, again, we, we tend to take distressed properties, the places that people don't like, mm -hmm. and we tend to fall in love with them. And that's what we did. We found this place that was really a wreck, and the previous owners had sort of done a half-assed way of, of trying to start fixing it up, but they hadn't gotten there yet. You know, my, my, my boy Sammy, we, we'd walked him through to show it, and he said, Dad, please don't buy this place. It smells. Oh, Sammy. I said, Sammy, I'm sorry. It, I love it. You know, it, 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 I knew what was there. And, and so we found a place at an amazingly cheap price, and we were able, um, even in our distress, to, you know, to put down a down payment. So we were buying the new place. So, in other words, you waited to declare bankruptcy until you had the house, right? We waited to seriously consider bankruptcy, but right, we, yeah. were, we, we wanted to have a house first. Right, because otherwise your, your credit is trashed, you won't qualify for the mortgage, we right? We won't be able to buy a house. Okay. We wouldn't be able to buy a house for at least seven years, and, and the income was still there. Okay, so you're making money, now you declare bankruptcy. Yes or no? No. Why? I went to talk to a bankruptcy lawyer. Now that I've been told you have to declare bankruptcy, you just have to file, you don't have any choice, I go to... The first bankruptcy lawyer who says, you know, I feel for you, but the asset level that you're at really isn't what I deal with. Mm. In other words, I wasn't failing big enough for this lawyer. You're too poor for me. I'm too poor to fail. You, we need richer bankrupt people. Exactly right. Uh -huh. Your assets are not attractive. And so, you know, I take this because I don't fear failure. Yeah. All that. I, you know, I, don't, I'm, I can deal with it. And she has the recommendation of a second bankruptcy lawyer who deals with people more at real poor people, my level. Yeah, and and uh, and I get him on the phone, and he says, "Okay, I see your situation. You don't need to file for bankruptcy. What you need to do is default on your apartment. You need to stop paying on the apartment. Let the bank take it back. You can offer to do all kinds of things, and you know to make it easier, um, but." Really, you're going to lose the apartment. And once that's over, I think you can get through this without filing for bankruptcy. And I, this sounds crazy to me, but he seems like a smart guy, and he's extremely reassuring. And, uh, and some months later, we lose the apartment. And I say, and I go back to him and say, do I have to file for bankruptcy now? And he said, no, but call me if anything else happens. And then we get the letter from the people that assumed the debt. And they're at us for the deficiency on the apartment, which is about $40,000 at this point, mm -hmm. what's left. And I call the guy and say, I've got to file for bankruptcy now, right? And he says, no, not really. What you need to do now is bargain with these people and see how low they'll go because they didn't spend $40,000. They just have the right to get $40,000. And if you go back to them with a lower amount, they will accept it. And again, I start come back with a number, they come back with a number, and I don't remember whether it's 10,000 or 12,000, but in there, we've got a deal. And how'd you get the 10 or 12 grand? My parents loaned it to me. All right, good, I love parents it's a who great, do that. It's, it's a great thing, and they helped us out, and we paid them back, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was an emergency, and they wanted the help. Okay, so at that point, Let's push this story ahead because I'm I, you're like that's an unlucky situation. It's okay? an unlucky situation. That's not the worst financial screw up in the world. I mean, you I mean, if this thing didn't have that weird co-op issue, you would have sold it. Even if you lost the 10 or 12 grand originally, you could have absorbed it and moved on. So you got unlucky. And what happened after that? Now you're in D.C. You got your fixer upper house. Um, we've got a credit card debt that. How come? Well, when you lose a boiler, you can't really say, gee, we'll fix that when we get to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, so those thousands of dollars go on the card. But also, guess what? The kids need orthodontia. And the expenses of life pile up. Mm -hmm. And it's not like we're taking crazy vacations. We've never taken big vacations. Life hits you, and I've got a paycheck coming in. Gene has stopped working. Mm -hmm because um, the three kids need a lot of managing. And so now we're on one income, mm. and, uh, and it's just tight. Yeah. And, and so the credit card debt is mounting, which means that, that you're paying interest on top of everything else. But you're still contributing to your 401k at the post. Right, because once I get to the new job, 
Um, for one thing, I'm still with the Washington Post company. And so it's the same deal. And I keep it at 10% and I don't mess with it. I did dip into the 401k to pay the down payment on the new house. So you took a loan? I took a loan out of the 401k. Okay. But beyond that, I just you know, continued to put that 10% away. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to our interview with New York Times reporter and author John Schwartz. Well, well, it's about uh, bewitching time for your taxes. You know, if you haven't done them by now, you're just a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. You like to wait till the last minute. And maybe as you complete your taxes this year, you find that you got hammered in your investment accounts because you keep trading like a knucklehead. And maybe you find that you're invested in mutual funds that are distributing massive capital gains. Tax time is a perfect time to look at the tax efficiency of your investing. And our sponsor, Betterment, encourages you to do that. In fact, Betterment has tax saving strategies to help increase your after-tax returns. Everything Betterment does is designed to lower your taxes and increase your returns. They don't get commissions for recommending funds. They don't have funds of their own. That means that Betterment does what they believe is right for you. Go check out Betterment at betterment.com slash better off. Betterment, rethink what your money can do. And now back to our interview with John Schwartz. So what's the tipping point in this next phase where the credit card debt becomes more than you can bear? Are you spooked? Are you emo- are you not sleeping at night? What's happening for you emotionally with this? I just don't have any money. I get the paycheck. Gene looks at the paycheck. Gene is the chief financial officer for our little family corporation. And she looks at the paycheck. And every week, she then pays what can be paid puts off what can't be paid, and tells me, you have this much money until the next paycheck. Mm -hmm. And it's up to me to spend it in, you know, in any way I can. And I've got to figure out, you know, are we going to take the kids to a movie? We're not eating out much, but if we're going to eat out, you know, when are we going to do that? And and then you go to the places that you can squeeze, and you squeeze like hell. Mm -hmm. What's the next critical level? Between the orthodontia and home repairs. We start to get foundation cracks in the house. We need to do huge amounts of work to deal with a wet basement. Mm. And all of it is just piling on the debt in ways that are completely unmanageable. At which point, I get a job offer from the New York Times. In New York? In New York. Okay. Which means I have to move again. Mm -hmm. But this time, I'm in a house that we actually might be able to sell. Uh, We're able to sell it for nearly double what we paid for it. Ah, credit card debt be gone. We wipe out the credit card debt. We pay off the orthodontist. We, you know, all the... Put a few shekels in the bank. We have a little something in the bank. I go, we move to New York. We find a house. I buy a car with cash. You're living large. It's fabulous. So you move to the suburbs? And we move to the suburbs. Because you said, got to have public school, good public school, blah, blah, blah. Exactly right. Uh-huh. And uh, and we find the town of Milburn, New Jersey, mm-hmm. which is lovely. Mm-hmm. And uh, the only problem is that all the, all the houses are too expensive. And, uh, and we deal with a relocation specialist company, which leads us to a very good realtor in who knows this town of Milburn and uh, Maplewood and it's sort of New Jersey towns. And she asks us what we think we can pay. And I've sort of figured out, okay, if we get a mortgage at this level... We can probably make the bills. Okay. And I say that is 400 and under. Okay. But really- What year are we in? We are in 2000. Okay. And she starts taking us around, and the houses that she's showing us are at 450. Mm-hmm. At the end of the first day, we see 11 houses, you know, in the first day, and then there's a second day coming. And I said, you know, you're not listening. I told you what our limit is. And she said, John, you're not going to find a house that meets your standards- at under $400,000. And I said, Arlene, you have no idea how low my standards are. <laughs> so did you find one? I asked her to hand me the MLS sheet. She had yeah. printed it. This is 2000, so she's printed out yeah. the, the, uh, the multiple listing service reports. I go through, and I now have sorted from cheapest to most expensive. And the cheapest one says, not a drive-by, which is a signal to me that this is 
a crap house. So ugly. Mm-hmm. It's ugly from the outside, probably ugly on the inside. And I say, let's try this one. How much? $329,000. Oh, I like that number. It was a wonderful number. It was an astonishingly ugly house. All right. What'd you end up buying? I ended up buying that house. I love that. You bought an ugly, you bought the ugly duck We line. bought the ugly house. Uh, the owner had painted it pink. This apparently made it less attractive to people. In a market that was on fire, this thing had been on the market for five months. Mm-hmm. And we walked through and... It was one of these 1950s splits with stairs up and down and up and down and up and down. And, you know, and you could tell that the basement was probably going to get moist at some time or Mm -hmm. another. And it was not attractive. But you had enough money for the down payment and the mortgage on that house. And now it's the year 2000, just to put this in. And we had the money to fix it up, And you got some money and you got some money to fix it up. So, like, it's 2000. Has the, has the uh, dot-com boom bust at that point? Is it mid-2000, end-2000? The are bust we? has come. Okay, we're, so... We're, we're, we are in the summer of 2000. Okay, so. so you're at the very bottom of the real estate cycle for that particular cycle. You don't know that. Mm-hmm. And you're acting responsibly. So what's the bad news here? Um, the bad news is that it's still a very expensive place to live, mm. and we're still in the Northeast. Oh, and you're and, a journalist. I forgot I'm a about that. Journalist. That's right. The whole decision about the five years and the dental plan. Yeah. I didn't become that lawyer, and so I'm trying to do all this again on the single income. And I feel like I would have made. If I were your financial planner, I think I might have kicked your wife's ass and told her to go back to work. Would that have been possible? At the time, it was a really good idea to stay home with these kids. All right. Fair uh-huh. enough. You know them better than I do. But I'm just saying, like, objectively, I'm like, oof, there's a lot of burden on one income. It's, it's a lot of burden, but um, but there were enough reasons to want to be there for them at okay. that time that that I said, yeah, you're right. Okay. And within a few years, she then started picking up work mm. as, a, uh, as a crossing guard at the local schools mm-hmm. and a lunchroom aid and doing things. That kept her in the schedule that, with the kids, right? Kept yeah. her in the schedule with the kids, allowed her to be home, but we're also bringing home in in this in the town where she was doing it twenty twenty five dollars an hour or more. So, you know, a reasonable yeah amount of money for part time work. Sure. So her income becomes important to us. Yep. And she's helping. Right. And my income is fine. And throughout this process, I'm also occasionally getting a book contract. And living large on that, man. Well, well <laughs> it helps. <laughs> 2000 to the financial crisis. Tells me, tell me how you guys do between 2000 and the financial crisis. So let's go the, the eight years from 2000 to 2008. How would you rate yourselves financially in terms of like how you're managing your cash flow? The cash flow is I am able to decide in the morning after I drop off Sammy and Elizabeth at school that on my way back, I can pick up a Starbucks latte and a, for Jean and an espresso for me. I felt that I was in a position where I could do that much. But you, you have the little squish room. Yeah. You've got some, like, I can have room. a little bit of a, like, a daily dose of, like, we're okay. And that's what that latte represents right. to it's, you. It's the, it's the little bit of indulgence yep. and pleasure that yep. sort of gets you through the day. So... You're doing okay for those years. How'd you come through the financial crisis, okay? Like, you did you get panic and, like, do anything nutty with your 401k? I got panicked and I did not do anything nutty with my 401k. Okay, fair enough. Um, the idea that don't just stand there, do something, that's pretty good advice when action is called for. But don't just do something, stand there is pretty good advice, too, at other times. Yeah. And we lost about 40%. Mm. of what was in our 401k. It just went away. And my response to this was to stop opening the envelopes. Okay. I Listen, you know what? I think that ostrich approach, as long as it stops you from doing anything dopey, I'm, I'm okay with it for that period of time. Yeah, right. And I'm not beyond panic. Of course. I mean, when we had this dip a few weeks ago, you know, I, I called up Vanguard and started and talked to the very nice person on the phone about well, what about money market accounts? I mean, mm, like God. right now, what? You I'm know, gonna tell you something. I'm giving you my cell phone, and you're never gonna make that call ever again. I'm gonna be like your your sponsor in AA. 
that I swear to God, I'm going to prevent you from doing that. Jill, yes, I didn't do it. I know, but still, in all, do it. I would love to be able to call you about that. But this person was like the person at the crisis hotline who says, "Okay, you're having a bad trip right now, right? But you just need to get a little grounded, a little centered, and you need to breathe, right?" And then I realized that I was giving in to everything I'm trying to tell people not to give in to. Yep. And I let it ride. All right, 2009 to 2015. So the market is climbing back. And how do you decide to write this article that is so exposing about your financial life? Well, first of all, I was offered the assignment. Oh, so you didn't pitch it. They came to you? Well, at the times, we have special sections. And if you write for the special sections, you can get paid a little extra. Mm. And I love writing for the special sections because the people are wonderful. And... There's money. And so I had been thinking, I really got to think about this. I really got to deal with some of these issues. And the retirement special section was coming up. And, you know, the editor comes to me and says, would you like to do something? And I said, I need to look at this stuff. Will you give me the excuse to actually do this? Because even though I'm scared and lazy, if I'm going to get paid to do something, I'm going to do it. Right. You know that, like, under deadline, you're going to do it. Yeah. With a deadline, with a paycheck involved, with an editor who I will disappoint if I don't do it, mm. then I'm going to go. And so in doing it, I realized that a certain amount of honesty was required. And I write first-person pieces for the paper. Mm-hmm. I mean, I do, I do a lot of straight reporting. I write about climate change for the paper. I've written about infrastructure and law and all sorts of things. But when I write about personal finance, I often do first-person pieces because I try to make them funny. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing a quarterly piece for the mutual funds section that is funny or tries to be funny. And so this, to me, was was in that vein Mm -hmm. that I would try to go through the process of figuring out where I stood for retirement and explain why I was so late in coming to this. And to do that honestly, you've got to admit that you're kind of being an idiot. So when you when you think about this process, talk about some of the emotions. I mean, you say, you know, I had to be honest. You open the book with I'm an idiot. Talk about the emotions behind this. What is it that you think prevented you from really grabbing hold of this earlier? I mean, again, I feel like that first part of the, your life, which was this crazy apartment fiasco, is a one off. But what was it in your emotional body that prevented you from grabbing hold of this after that? I just don't like thinking about money. Why? My money. I'm scared of it. What are you scared about? Let's talk about that. I'm interested. I have never understood why, but I can explain that I am. Okay. You know. Yeah, I I got that. You know, uh, these things are braided in our minds. Look, my folks were terrific, and my dad took care of us, and my mother loved us and so it wasn't it it wasn't like going through some terrible emotional crucible growing up Mm -hmm. but we also just didn't talk about money how are your siblings same ish around money do they have different money issues than you i think they're smarter about money than i am Again, Uh, the journalism thing i I chose journalism (laughs) the two brothers who are lawyers doing very well yeah the younger brother who's an ophthalmologist doing very 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 well Mm. and he's very conscious of money stuff. I mean, he's really good with it and mm-hmm. and uh, and has been smart on these issues his whole life. Well, what is the, besides picking up the book and reading, this is the year I put my financial life in order, what is the message that you want? I mean, this book has a ton of stuff in there. There's real usable financial planning tips, tools, advice with humor. What is it that you want? What's your message? The first message is that if you've never wanted to read a financial book because, like me, you're scared of money, you don't like thinking about money, you hate thinking about money, maybe this is a book you could read because I've sweetened it a little bit. I mean, I've tried to be funny and I've tried to be not the ultra competent financial maven who usually writes these books, but somebody who screwed up again and again. Mm -hmm. And I would want that person to read the book and, first of all, get something out of it in terms of, wait, I can do these things. I can 
get a hold of this. I can figure out where I stand. Look, I read the chapter on writing a will. It doesn't look that hard. I, all I have to do is do it. All those things I want people to do. I also would be very happy if they read through it and said, Schwartz is such a dumbass. He I made, didn't say that. You did not say, did that, not say that out loud. No, I didn't you say didn't that. You didn't say it out loud. But if they say that to themselves and they say, well, I certainly wouldn't do it that way. I'll do it this way. And they've got a life plan. A negative example is good. It can be. But I think that from my point of view and as someone who is a CFP and talks about this stuff, I think that your candor is what is really going to is going to break through. I think that when people hear that here's a smart dude who says he's an idiot and we all have we're idiotic about certain things. You know, I can't say that I've made the greatest choices in relationships. Let me just be honest. Right. Okay. And uh, you found your college sweetheart and you've lasted all these years. Decades later, you're you hit the jackpot. Right. I think so. So it's a lot to be said for marrying up. Yeah. Right. right. Um, but I think what's interesting is that, you know, we have a great expectations of ourselves in this particular area and we don't do a great job of talking about it. So I uh, what I really loved about it is that you're talking about it and you're you're being so open. And I think that if you're listening out there and you're saying to yourself, you know, I like this man. This man is like me because many of the people that I encounter and people who call into the show and write us have a lot of shame. They'll say my parents could have were, you know, middle class people who gave me a lifestyle that I can't give my kids. And I feel really horrible about that. So I think that this is a book. And your message is just really important that we don't need to have judgments. We've got plenty of people who shake their fists and fingers at us in life. John Schwartz, you're not that guy. You're kind of like the you're like the guy who says it's OK. It's going to be OK. And we're a club. Yeah. We're you know, we're, we're a fraternity of people yeah. who haven't done great, but we can do this. Yeah, exactly. And we can try and we can. And, and even if you're in your 40s. And you're in your 50s, you can still do it. And that there's a, there's never a too late. Well, there is probably a too late. But, you know, hopefully in your 40s and 50s, it ain't too late. I started this in my 50s. And when I talked to financial advisors and people like John Bogle, you know, because I interviewed him for the book. And Bogle, you know, who is in his late 80s, right? Yep. And he's had a heart transplant, right? Yep. And he says, you're a kid. And... I certainly would like to still be working. I love my work. I would like to still be working in 15 or 20, you know, even 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm earning, shouldn't I still be saving? And if I'm doing all of that, shouldn't I be on track to, when I do stop working, live in comfort? Right. And not luxury, but comfort is perfect. So we started the interview and I said, what was your best financial decision? So in retrospect, of all the myriad of financial goof-ups that we all have, what do you think was the worst financial decision when you look back now? It would be hard to beat buying that apartment. The Washington Heights the apartment? The Washington, Washington Heights apartment. I wonder what it's like worth it. today. Oh, I've checked. It's more than a million. You know what? That's why you're crazy. <laughs> you're nuts because you actually do check. Yeah. Right? Well, <laughs> this is what I do. This drives Gene crazy, but, you know, I buy... A pair of waterproof boots. Yeah. And then I check the prices I could have had. Oh, you really are nuts. It's, Mark's it's laughing just, at you. Well, he's, you he's know, giving you the, he's giving Mark you is, the, Mark is not wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am not a look back person. I'm a look ahead person. I would like sure. to not be a look back person, but it's part of who I am. I get you. It has been an incredible delight and honor to have you here today. You are so nice. Thanks so much to John Schwartz. Go get his book. This is the year I put my financial life in order. And thanks to you for listening. If you'd like to subscribe to the Better Off podcast, you can just hop onto the website jillonmoney.com or download it anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Google Play, or Stitcher. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. We're distributed by Cadence 13. Mark Talercio is our executive producer, and we're sponsored by Betterment. Talk to you next week.